All right, let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, so we are now going to apply uh, this idea of encoding objects in vectors and looking at the distances between them to documents. Uh, but we're going to, we'll get there by the end of this three hour lecture. But um, first we're just going to talk about text analysis in general. Mostly data journalism classes talk about numbers. Um, we're not going to really talk about numbers, almost not at all in this class. Uh, not because they're not wonderful, but because uh, text is in many ways both harder for computers to deal with and also I think more interesting because, um, you know, if you want to describe something in the world, most of the time there isn't a better way to do it than human language. Human language has evolved over thousands of years to be a really amazing system for telling someone something else that happened over here. And so teaching computers to understand that uh, unlocks all of the world's information that is written in text. The first thing we're going to do is try to uh, define it. And the core idea here is that quantitative information of some sort, so some type of numeric uh, or quantitative information that you can derive from text tells a story. Much like the visualization that we produced told a story about the voting in the House of Lords. So here's an example um, uh, from uh, the China Media Project uh, here. And um, this is basic word counting. So as I think you, you must know, there are these, uh, he calls them watchwords, these various standard phrases, you know, harmonious society in this case, uh, uh, socialism of Chinese characteristics, uh, uh, this sort of thing. And especially in the People's Daily, which is of course the government organ, uh, you can look at the rise and fall of the use of these phrases. So here's what he did, and he says, well, through the middle 2000s, harmonious society peaked, and then it fell off. Uh, meanwhile, stability pres preservation, as harmonious society was going up, or it was falling off, stability preservation was coming up. So it's uh, the way, uh, and of course both of these are, are basically euphemisms for talking about social unrest and protests and this sort of thing. And the way in which the government talks about these things has changed. Uh, and he argues that this, this change in language is also a change in approach towards a more forceful approach. It's less about you know, feeling good together and more about uh, using force to suppress dissent. So that's, the, that's the, the, maybe the most basic type of text analysis you can do, is count words. You're running it through a computer, you gotta count something, you can start with counting words. But this is kind of a, a special example. And the reason it's special is uh, because these phrases, the very specific phrases, harmonious society, stability preservation, they mean very specific things. They're used very carefully. Um, if you just count you know, any random word, you might not get, it might not be as clear what it means. If you count the word um, bank, that means both the financial institution and the side of a river and uh, a plane going like this. So if you just count the word bank, you, you, don't, you, you can't disambiguate the senses. You don't know how people are using it. It's much harder to say what it means that bank is used twice as often now than it was 100 years ago. Who knows, really? Nonetheless, um, word counting uh, can give you remarkable results, especially if you use it on the right type of data. Uh, so I assume most of you have seen Google Books. It turns out that Google Books has digitized um, in the English language 12% uh, of the books ever written uh, since the beginning of books. They have books going back to the 1500s. So that's, uh, that's a lot of words. It is in fact one of the largest uh, text 
uh, corpuses. Corpus, corpus. I never know how to pluralize that word. It is just about the largest text corpus ever assembled. And um, they have built this thing called Google Ngram Viewer. Uh, how many people know what an Ngram is? Yeah. Yeah. So an n-gram is this fundamental unit of language that you see a lot in computer language processing. A unigram, one word. So in this case, I'm graphing some unigrams. I'm looking at the relative occurrence of skiing, tennis, chess, and snowboarding. Um, but it actually, this is, it has all n-grams up to length five. Uh, so if I look at this graph, it kind of tells a story. Remember, this is how, this is the fraction of books that these words occur in. So it says that in 18, uh, let's say 1940, tennis appeared in 0.0005% of all books ever written. So that's 50 in, what was that, 5 in 10,000. No, 5 in a million, because it's a percentage. Uh, and you can sort of look at this picture and construct a story. And so what, what story do we want to make from looking at this, these word counts? Anyone want to tell a story from this graph? It's not, it's not a complicated thing. It's just, what do you see? So snowboarding isn't in books at all until like 1990. And then the orange line says like love and suspense, which is Yeah, so that's chess. So chess looks to be about as popular now as it was in 1800, a little bit more. And then what else? Do you want to check out any specific events happening um, during you know, this period or the red line at it? Yeah, so somewhere around 1938 or something, tennis was really popular, and then it started going down, and then it got popular again. Yeah, so you can tell all sorts of stories, right? Uh, so here's a story you can tell. Um, chess was more popular than tennis until the 20th century. Of course, that's not really what this says. What this says is the word chess appeared in more books than the word tennis until the 1920s. So maybe tennis was actually more popular, but the people were too busy playing it to write about it. You don't really know, right? So you gotta, you gotta be careful with this. But let's play with this. This is one of my favorite things. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, uh, Albert Einstein, Sherlock Holmes, Frankenstein. So uh, those, Albert Einstein is a bigram, meaning two words. Sherlock Holmes is the same, Frankenstein. So uh, there you go. You can sort of see it's interactive. Of course, you don't get Frankenstein until after the book is published. And then, you know, in the early 1920s, you know, the height of the, uh, you know, the H.P. Lovecraft was publishing all that stuff. You know, there's a real, it was an eldritch era. era. Um, eldritch is one of my favorite English words. It means like sort of horror. Uh, and then, wow, look at that. Frankenstein got really popular after the 60s. Who knows why? Let's try some other things. Let's try, um, I'm, oh, there you go, I have it. I must versus I need to. So first of all, we see that I must is way more common just generally. But I need to has become more common. Uh, Not at all. Or maybe it is. I'm lying. It depends how, it depends how they processed it. Um, wow, good, good call. They actually, you can download the, oh, graph these case sensitive comma separated bases. Nice, you read the instructions. <laughs> 
You'll go far. Um, <laughs> anyone else want to take a look at some things? Wow, look at that. What's the green one? Radio. Radio looks popular in the 40s. There's a typo? Oh, you're right. Oh, actually, let's try it both ways. Internet, big I is... They both climb up, but big eye is clearly winning. So you can look at the trajectories of these things. What's this one? Telephone. Less popular, but now popular again. Telegram. Uh, long, slow decline. Anyway, the, there's a paper on this. People have done things like looked at uh, censored books in, during Nazi Germany. By the, this, you can do this in uh, German, too. Um, there you go. Here are all the languages that they have. Um, so using the German version of this, look at the names of certain authors, and what you see is that there's a dip during the, uh, the Nazi regime. Um, people have done all kinds of things with this. And uh, it's, you have to be a little bit careful because, for example, this is only books. It doesn't have the internet. So maybe something's really popular. Um, and you don't know because it's only tweeted about, right? Let's try this one. Um, I bet we'll find the typos, too. <laughs> so there has, oh, but look at it, it only goes to 2,000. No. So, oh, it only goes to 2008, that's why, because they only, they only have the, um, the books digitized in 2008. So she doesn't appear at all, right? Um, let's pick another pop star. Who, oh. Oh, look at that, the Beatles are more popular than ever. Anyway, so you can, you can sort of do this, uh, do this type of, of quantitative analysis. It's not completely obvious what it means, but maybe it's a, maybe it's a hint. Maybe it's a story. Um, oh, this is fun. I think this is hilarious, but I'm, I'm a nerd. Um, Downton Abbey. You all know what this show is? It's this television series about this English manner and people being English. Um, <laughs> So there are all of these people saying, hey, it's, it's set in 1917, right? Um, and there are all these people saying, hey, people didn't say that in 1917. But this guy who is a, um, he, he works in the digital humanities at Princeton. He's doing a PhD there. One of my favorite blogs. Uh, and he said, well, you know what? I'm just going to check every word, not just you know, five of them. Because, and this is, this is maybe one of the, the reasons why you want to do quantitative work is in some cases, rather than sort of case studies, you can look at everything, right? So if you have the right sort of data, that's one of the advantages of data potentially that um, one of you said earlier. You know, I can write a story about a pollution in a town in China, but if I have the data for every town, then I can prove it's not just an isolated incident. I know that it's happening everywhere. So here we go, bigrams, two word phrases. These are things that people say on the television show that do not appear in any of the books from that time period. So nobody said, no, no, sorry, nobody wrote in books relax together between 1912 and 1921. In fact, nobody wrote in the books that Google has managed to digitize, which at a guess is 12%. It doesn't mean nobody said, nobody said relax together because written English is different from spoken English. So you, again, I, I want to caution you about interpretation. But still, it's very interesting. Want grandchildren. Really? 
Nobody said I want, wrote I want grandchildren. Uh, having pancakes. And my per personal favorite, unicorn if. Staff luncheon. I love this stuff. Fairly grand. That's fairly grand. Nobody wrote that. Um, this is maybe more interesting. Things that uh, appeared in books but were much more common today than they were. So um, black market, people, it was in the books, but not very much. Um, from scratch, you gonna. I love this stuff. Workload, guest bedroom, exercise classes. Not, not a lot of people writing about exercise classes in 1912. <laughs> but they would have written it some other way, right? It doesn't mean there was no exercise classes. It means, you know, they probably wrote uh, you know, bracing constitutional instead of long walk. I mean, who knows, right? Um, or you can do this for every word. So what this is, um, the horizontal axis is just the, the frequency in books from the time period overall, right? So stuff that's more to the right is just more commonly said. And then uh, vertical axis is a, a logarithmic scale, how much more common it is in the script to the television show than it is in the books. So zero, you can see this zero line here, it passes pretty much uh, right through the center of the blob. Um, so 10 to the zero is one, so that means it appears about as much in the books as it does in the script. And most of it's this, this big blob around the zero. So that big blob means that, yeah, basically the language is the same then as it was now. But then you've got this stuff up here, the stuff about the one line. So here you go, need to. That's about 10 to the one, or 100 times more common in the script than it is in uh, the books of the era. Can you get the door? Thank you. And then there's these crazy ones, right? Just need black market. So here's a question for you. You've got the stuff that's really high up tends to be in this upper left corner. Why? What does that mean? What are we seeing there? And I will tell you, I mean, I can read them to you. The rematch, wartime marriage, camp posture. I can tell you the answer to that question doesn't depend on what the phrases are. Just, in fact, Without knowing anything about what they're saying, I expect to see a lot of things up there. Why? They are well. They do appear in the script a lot because the f that means they're a uh, hundred or a thousand times more common. Yes. So they're all to the far left, meaning that they don't appear very commonly anyway. Right? So maybe in, the whole, in that whole period of the whole corpus of books, uh, can posture only appears once. That means if it appears 10 times in the scripts, it's immediately 10 times more common. But maybe people said it all the time in 1917. It's just that it was a very rare thing. So. Um, the short answer is you expect to get more noise in the rare words. Uh, and, and in fact, this is a, a lesson in statistics in general. The more rare the thing you are studying is, or the less data that you have, the more you're going to see extreme values. In fact, this is a, we'll talk about this in much more detail in the drawing conclusions class, but say you take, you do an analysis of test scores in Chinese counties. The counties which score very high or very low are going to be the counties with the smaller populations because you don't have as big a sample and so you're going to get more noise. And so uh, people forget this all the time, right? You'll do this analysis and you'll be like, oh look, it's the small firms that have the highest levels of employee satisfaction. Well, no, it's the small firms that are the outliers. They also have the lowest levels of employee satisfaction. Anyway, um, statistical warnings aside, I think this is kind of cool. So, text analysis. 
the things we have looked at so far are counting words. Uh, what are some problems with counting words? It doesn't, it doesn't give us a complete picture. Why? You and then you. Carmen? Mm -hmm. Well, we can talk about women, but we might not be addressing women issues. Mm -hmm. We could just be saying it generally. Right. Or, um, here's another interesting problem. Does that mean there wasn't any feminism before the 1970s? No, they just said it differently. Oh wow, more popular than all of them. <laughs> starting from but starting from the seventies. So yeah, you could be using different words. And then we had an answer over here. You I think? Yeah, I mean, the, the engrams help a little bit, right? Because if I only had the word women's, right? So if I just do this, this is not a good way to tell the history of feminism. <laughs> oh, really? OK. Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it, you lose the context. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to say one thing. You might also be looking at the wrong thing, right? You might be going, I got this great story. Men are becoming less talked about than women. Well, I, I don't, I mean, maybe? Uh, without reading the original books, uh, it's hard to say. So, what we're going to look at now is a technique for studying an entire document. We're going to talk about document clustering first, then we're going to talk about um, topic analysis. Um, stuff. I'm not going to read the slide, that's lame. Um, our objects of study are documents now, and we want to convert a document into a feature vector. Uh, so how do we do that? What numbers describe a document? Anyone want to, how do we digitize a document? Yeah. Word count. Yeah. Could be very interesting if, we, if the length is significant. What else? Sorry? Characters. What, uh, sorry, is that what you said? Vocabulary. How, how do we make that quantitative? Number. And the number of similar characters. How do we how do we make a computer do that? Sorry, what? Frequency. Frequency. Yeah, frequency of characters, or fre Yeah. Okay. And you said keyword. What's a keyword? Remember, we have to program a computer to do this. So it has to be something that's very well defined. Mm. But that's kind of the same as doing these these word counts, though, right? 
I mean, that's basically what we're doing here is we're picking some keywords and looking. But if, uh, but what I'm asking for is I can, I can, I'm asking you write me a program that I can give that program any document and it will give me back a vector of numbers that describe that document. That's the problem we're trying to solve. So this is a hard problem. Um, people started thinking about this a long time ago. In fact, uh, search engine research, which is uh, it's called information retrieval research in computer science, started in the first thing you could call search engine research um, was in 1946. Um, and actually, it, it was an amazing article. They, they invented the idea of hypertext as well, like the hyperlink. But they thought about doing it mechanically without computers. It's an amazing thing called a memex. Um, really, in the 50s at IBM, it got started. And they tried a lot of different things. And eventually, it turned out that um, uh, word frequency actually works pretty well. So here's the, um, the most commonly occurring words in a particular document. What's this document about? Animal cruelty. Animal cruelty. Uh, in particular, criminal animal cruelty. What else do you see in this list? Yeah. In fact, in English text, 7% of the words will be the. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, wait a minute. How can only 6% of books contain the? That there's something wrong there. Hmm. Anyway. Um, No, I thought this was 6% of all books contained that phrase, but now I think that it's something else. You can get the data, by the way. You can download um, up, to, up to five grams, right? Let's open one of these up. Yeah. Now we're having fun. Uh, where did it go? I don't know where it went. Anyway, um, yeah, and all it is, is it tells you for every year, for every set of one, two, three, four, or five words, uh, how many times it appeared. It's actually incredibly useful for language processing. Um, anyway, so word frequencies is not bad, actually, uh, because uh, well, I mean, it's just word counting, but now you're counting every word. And, you know, so if, if a document says women's issues one place and uh, feminism a different place, you have both. And this is a word cloud. You've all seen this. Um, what stands out? Yeah. What else? Yeah. So you get kind of the same thing, same picture. In fact, there are other things in here, because I know what this document is, so I can see them, because I know what the document's about, and they're here, but they're not standing out. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, there are some names, yeah. Sort of. Close. So this is basically the technique, right? You store the features are words. And you count how many times each word appears in the document. And uh, the dimension of the feature vector is the number of different words in the document. In fact, what you normally do is you have a whole set of documents, a whole corpus. And then the dimension is the number of different words that appear in all documents, or the vocabulary of the document. 
Um, pretty straightforward. So here we go, some examples. Terminology, um, our data matrix. Remember the data matrix? That's the set of feature vectors. It is now called a term document matrix. Um, so here's two documents as the two rows. And um, here's some made up sentences in there. That's what the data matrix looks like. A uh, little notation, TF stands for term frequency. Uh, TF is, a f is, you can think of it as a function of two things, the term and the document. So TF of like and D1 is one, okay? It's easy, easy enough so far. Um, this is a standard model. It's called the bag of words model. So it's, you know, I take a document and I cut out each word in a little paper and I throw it in a bag and I shake it all up. Um, it throws out meaning because in most languages, word order carries meaning. So for example, in, in many languages, um, the subject and object are differentiated by position. Not in all languages, but in, in most. Uh, and so um, you, you can't tell apart concepts which, have, which depend on word order, right? So I take this, this, this bag of words and I give it to you and I say, tell me what the document's about. And, uh, and you say, well, and I say, is it about shoulder, soldiers shooting civilians or is it about civilians shooting soldiers? And you have to say, what? I don't know. It's gone. Um, a sort of little side note. This is actually a, a kind of big note, which um, for our purposes is going to be a small, a small note. Uh, documents don't come as words. Uh, I know that's kind of a funny thing to say, but when you think about it, when you store a document on a computer, you have a, a string. You have a list of characters and then you have to break it into words. Um, now this is, I think, more obvious in, in Chinese uh, because you don't have spaces between words. But uh, in a language like English or you know, most languages that have words with, they're written with spaces, um, it's, it's, I don't know, I don't think it's completely obvious that you have to tokenize things. And also there's the issue of case sensitivity, right? Is capital I a different token than lowercase i? Remember, your, your, the, each dimension in your feature space is a particular word. So what's a particular word? Is that's without an apostrophe different from that's with an apostrophe? Uh, and also, you get things that aren't words, right? If someone said, you get numbers, 30 March. Um, uh, or you get weird things like the, you know, the, the XK2000 machine. Right, so SK2000, is that a word or do you throw that out? Uh, someone writes names, you get people's names, latitudes and longitudes, you know. Latitude, you know, plus 45.238. Uh, scientific notation, 1.3489. Um, I mean, if you just break on spaces, you get all of this stuff that you don't think of as words and you have to decide what to do with it. You get punctuation, you get hyphenated names, quotations. Um, and you can actually sort of see some of this when uh, Google, Google talks about this. So I type in women's apostrophe s issues and there you go, treats quotation marks literally. So it's, it keeps quotations, but turns, what they've done is when they see apostrophe s at the end of the word, they turn it into a separate token. So women's issues, which I think of as two words, um, they're actually, turning into or representing as a trigram, three tokens. And apostrophe S is one of their tokens. And they also keep quotation marks. So, you know, fish and fish. Are different. You can see that fish is unquoted much more of the time. Oh, actually, no, it looks like what they do is they turn a quotation mark into a separate token. And you can see in how they, they have the data. Um, 
you know, they, they keep the numbers in, and they also have the punctuation in here somewhere. There you go, punctuation. So there's this question of how you turn a string into, well, you, you think of it as words, but it's not really words. It's um, tokens. It's chunks of language. And written language has a lot of, it's got periods, right? You, you want to keep track of periods because let's say I want to do um, how, of, you know, how often does a sentence end with to or put? Uh, this is, you know, dangling prepositions. This is something up with which I will not put. There you go. Now I can look at the rate of dangling twos over history. Uh, because that, uh, you know, put and then a dot, two tokens, bigram. Um, anyway, it's complicated sometimes. Oh, yeah, and then it gets even weirder, right? Because uh, this capital, this with a capital T starts a sentence. This with a lowercase t is probably in the middle, unless, of course, the person is writing without capitalization. Anyway. Um, for the text processing you will do in this class, uh, we're going to do the most idiotic, simplest possible thing, which is um, lowercase all letters, throw out all punctuation, and break on spaces. That's it. In particular, you're going to do this for the first assignment. To do tokenization in Chinese, uh, you need uh, a, an algorithm. Uh, it, it, there are several, there's lots of research on this. It's, there are several open source libraries to do this. Uh, but you can't break on spaces, so you actually need an algorithm with a dictionary and a probabilistic model of where phrases, uh, where words, uh, characters break into words. So it's a little more complicated. Um, right, distance function. How do we do, so we have a document. Document is now a list of uh, how many times each word appears. And it, this is mostly going to be zero, right? These are sparse vectors. Everybody f uh, familiar with the concept of a, a sparse vector? Who's not familiar? OK. So if I have, if I feed 1,000 documents into my document uh, vector creator, uh, maybe I'll get 10 or 20,000 different words used across all of those documents. But you know, each document might only use a couple thousand words. In fact, they might be short. If they're 300 word documents, then each document can use no more than 300 words. So that means that although the dimension of my space is 10,000, for any particular document, most of those features have to be zero. So what that means is uh, that, that's called sparseness. It means that most of the entries are zero. It means that when you store it, you don't store it as an array. You normally store it as a, as a set of pairs, index, and then value, or term, and then value. In fact, I've got one. I can show you what it looks like. Um, there we go. Uh, here we go. Uh, so this first string, this is just um, the document ID. But what you want to look at is here. This is the word. That's the weight. This is actually not a, a, a count. It's a frequency. So it's just divided by the length of the document. Um, so there you go. So in this case, this document has 239 different words in it. But I happen to know that for this corpus, the uh, Vocabulary size is about 12,000. So you don't store 12,000 zeros. You store 239 pairs of words and counts. Um, that's really important for efficiency. It actually, most of the algorithms wouldn't work if you don't do that. So distance function. I've got two vectors of word counts. And I want to know how similar the documents are. How do I do it? What's the distance function? Somebody make one up. Second to 
What's that? Length of the words. Length of the words. What do you mean, like how many different words it has? Yes. Yeah, so okay, so that's a distance function for sure. So what that will do is that will cluster documents that have similar average word length. Could. Yeah, uh, but okay, specifically, how do, I, how do I turn that into a numeric score? So yeah, so So I think there's two really important concepts that you got there. One is you're interested in words that appear in both documents. The other is words that appear more often should be more important somehow. Yeah. But in fact, um, yeah, what's, what's sometimes called the binary distance function, which is just does the word appear or not, actually works remarkably well, better than you might guess. And so all that is is just like with the voting where we were counting the number of votes were the same, you just count how many words they have in common. That's it. It's also called the, or the fraction of words they have in common, that is. Um, it's also called the Jacquard distance. It's that the Jacquard distance is just you take two sets and it's what fraction of things do they have in common. It works pretty well. Um, but we want something that's sensitive to how often they occur. So uh, we take a dot product of the vectors. Uh, dot product is, well, okay, somebody tell me what a dot product is. How do you compute it? I have two vectors, two sets of numbers. How do I compute the dot product? I know some of you have seen a dot product before. I'm absolutely certain. Don't make me beg. It's unseemly. All right, so let's, let's make this a little more concrete. Ah, somebody's saying the formula right now. Who was that? All right. Somebody knew it. Yeah. It's the sum of the uh, pairs, the paired products. So you just multiply that by that, and that by that, and that by that, and that by that, and so on. If you've got a thousand dimensions, that's it. Um, so an interesting thing happens when you take the dot product. Uh, if this is zero, what is the product of x3 and 0? Zero? 0, yeah. Or if this is 0, what's the product of 0 and y4? Yeah. So you only get a non-zero term in this sum where the words overlap, where, you, where a word appears in both documents. And then the next thing that happens is because you take the product, uh, if x2 is bigger, then, and, and y2 is not 0, then the bigger that x2 is, the bigger that that term is. And the same for y2. So you get now a formula that is, only counts where words overlap, and the more common the word is in either document, the more it contributes to the total um, similarity. 
Um, OK, once again, this is not a distance function. The, 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 you, you've run into this a lot. The, uh, similarity uh, is not the same as distance. What's the difference? So again, think of the definition of a distance function. If I take the distance between these two things, what is it? Zero, right. If I take the similarity, what is it? One, One right. Or high, anyway. Um, so so it's, uh, it, they just go in opposite directions. Normally, distance is 1 minus similarity and vice versa. Um, uh, not a complicated concept, but if you forget to do it, all of your clustering will break because you violate that definition that we saw earlier. Um, so let's take the problem of, now uh, there's, a, there's a leap here. How you build the search engine is you compare a query to the documents and you pick the one that has the smallest distance or you order them by the distance. Um, but there's a problem if you just do this with word frequency and the dot product, which is that longer documents are going to have more words. All of these counts are going to be higher. So to, to make this concrete, um, here's the actual counts, right? I only have car once in fast car. So OK, first of all, of the documents A and B, which one is a better match to Q? Which, if you were A, yeah. If you were searching for fast car, which one do you want? Yeah. So A is a better match. But uh, similarity with B is higher. Just the word car appears more times. So how do we solve this problem? Normalize it. Normalize it. What does that mean? Normalize the vector, yeah. Actually, um, yeah, that's exactly what you do. You just divide out the lengths of the vector. And when you do this, uh, what you get is you get a number between 0 and 1. And uh, if you're familiar with the formula for, yeah, there's a, this, this is the standard formula for the dot product. There's also a geometric formula. Has anyone seen the formula in terms of uh, vector lengths and angles? All right, so here's Who's seen this formula? This, uh, you should have seen this in, in high school geometry. Yeah? Wait, lo what, a long time ago? You, ne you weren't paying attention, were you? You didn't think it would ever be useful. Well, I'm here to tell you. Uh, yeah, tell your kids one day. Um, no, math. Math is useful. Okay, so. Without math, there would be no internet. Um, this is the same formula as the sum of pairs that we looked at. It does exactly the same thing. We just express it a different way. We express it in terms of the lengths of the vectors and the cosine. And if you're feeling very excited, you can prove that they're the same thing. It's actually not very hard. Um, I'm just not going to do it right now. So when we normalize the vectors, what is the length of a normalized vector? One, yeah. So A and B are one. So these just fall out. And there you go. You get the cosine of the angle. 
cos so if a and b are the same vector, what's the angle? Zero, yeah. Uh, so that means that um, you get cosine of zero, which is what? One, yeah. Half of you are like, I was asleep in trig. <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, now you know what it was for. It only took 10 years to find out. Um, yeah, so, so it's the same thing. It gives you a result in 0, 1. And in particular, when the angle is 90 degrees, cosine of 90 degrees is, OK. This has a, a, a geometric interpretation in terms of your vector space. So let's say that we have a language that has only two words in it. Cat and dog. OK? Um, our, our feature vectors are two-dimensional. If I have a point here, This is a document where cat appears twice and dog appears twice. So it's the document cat, dog, cat, dog, or dog, dog, cat, cat, or cat, dog, dog, cat, or there's not very many. Anyway, um, if I have a document where the word cat appears, but the word, I'm going to use a different color. If I have a document where the word uh, dog appears twice and cat appears zero times, it's there. If I have a weird where cat appears once and dog appears zero times, it's there. Um, if the angle between the two vectors is 90 degrees, that means they don't have any of the same words. And if they don't have any of the same words, what's the distance? What should the distance function return? Zero, yeah. The answer to like half of my questions is zero. Just like yell out zero whenever I say something. You'll be right some fraction of the time. Um, or sorry, the, sorry, the similarity is zero. The distance should be a maximum. So the distance should be one. Um, so that is the geometric interpretation of uh, what these vectors mean. And I, I want you to think of this stuff in terms of geometry. I mean, you can, work, you can always work it out with the math. But I want you to think in terms of this, this geometric intuition that if two vectors are perpendicular, they just talk about completely different things. So the words don't overlap. So they point in completely different directions. Because remember, in this high dimensional space, every direction is a word. So if I have things that are perpendicular, means they don't have the same words. So the documents must talk about different things. So we're, we're building up to a standard model here. So here we go, normalizing the query, uh, grinding through the math. There are some square roots. And now the similarity with A is higher than the similarity with B. Because uh, the denominator after the normalization, there you go, this, this, this 17, uh, because um, there's a lot of words. The, the, the 3 squared plus 1 squared and 1 squared and 1 squared is uh, 17. So it helps. It works. Um, there are different types of normalizations for document length. That's the uh, simplest one and uh, will work most of the time. Oh, yeah. So here's uh, there's the diagram I just drew, right? It's this, this idea of the, the angle between the vectors. And the main thing to realize is as the angle gets closer and closer together, so we've normalized the vectors. So we've thrown out the length of the document. The document used to be really long because you know, if there are five words, five, if car appeared five times, then it's um, you know, five. But we've normalized it. So we're not interested in the, uh, the length anymore. We're just looking at the angle. And as that angle gets closer and closer, it means that the 
sets of words and their frequencies um, are more and more similar. And so the angle goes to zero, which means the cosine goes to one, which means the similarity goes to one, which means the distance goes to zero. Anyway, it, it works out. Um, here you go, cosine distance. This is the textbook formula for uh, the standard distance function between two documents. The surprising thing is that this works. It actually works really well. Um, there are a lot of modifications. There are a lot of little versions. You can improve on this, but not very much. This will get you 80 or 90% of the way there in any sort of text processing or, or document clustering application. Oh, well, you need one more ingredient. Um, you've got to deal with the common words. If 7% of every English document is the, that means, you know, and, and the other 5% is like two and whatever, that means that right away, most documents are going to be aligned along that, on those dimensions. And so it's going to make things more similar than they are. It's, it's going to, you, you don't want to, you don't care how many times the appears in the document. It doesn't give you any information. So you want to get rid of it. So how do we handle this problem of very common words? What's the simplest possible thing we can do? What's that? Exclude them, yeah, just throw them out. So these very common words are called stop words. And uh, let me show you a stop word list. Uh, this is a project that some of you know I work on called Overview, which is a um, document visualization system for journalists. And in here, here you go. Here's some stop words. List of standard English words that it just throws out completely. And you need, you know, you need different stop words for each language. Everything we've talked about so far applies to every language. Stop words, you have different stop words in different languages. Here are the stop words in Spanish. Uh, so you need, you need a stop word list. Ooh, look at that. There's a bug in the stop word list. Um, but in fact, you can do better than just stop words. So stop words. Uh, you throw out the thes and the ofs and the a's and the is and the, all that stuff. You just don't use them. Um, but if you have a document set, let's say your document set is, is police reports. Um, maybe every single document has the word perpetrator five times or suspect. If you have a list of documents that are about uh, water quality, then every document's going to say water. You're kind of going to have stop, like they're not really stop words, but there are words that don't tell you anything in the context of the documents. So how do we deal with that? What's the, what can we try? Yeah, so I mean, if we know that everything's about water, we can just remove water by hand. But I want an algorithmic technique. I don't want to have to figure this out. Part of an analyzing a document set is I don't know what's in it. So maybe I don't know they all say suspect. Aha, uh -huh. there's the core of an idea there, which is look at which words are common in the documents and then throw them out or something. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you the answer because it took about 30 years for people to invent and we don't have that much time. Um, it's not a complicated answer, actually. So here's the problem. If I have whether a word is important in the document depends on the context. If I have general news stories and only f you know, f you know, 5% of them contain car, then car is probably an interesting word because it makes 
those documents different from all the other documents. If I have a, articles from Carr and Driver Magazine, then Carr is not an interesting word. So we want to account for this automatically. And in this is the core idea, which is to ask, how many documents does this word occur in? So here we go. Um, we define something. So term frequency is uh, how many times does this word appear in a document. Document frequency is how many documents does this word appear in. Uh, and it's normalized, which means we, it's a fraction. We divide by the number of documents. So for the, what is this going to be? What is the document frequency of the word the in some random document set in English? Yeah, one or nearly one, right? Whereas here, for car, document frequency on the left is going to be I don't know, 20%. On the right, it's going to be 90%. So when the document frequency goes up, uh, do we want to make that word more important or less important? Right. So what we actually do is inverse document frequency. We divide it. And we also take a logarithm um, because we want more sensitivity at the low end of the scale. We want, again, it's, we want the difference between 5% and 10% to be bigger than the difference between 80% and 85%, right? We want, we want sort of the same size. What the logarithm does is it talks about equal multiples. So 5 to 10% will give us the same difference as 50 to 100%. So we take a log. And notice I've also, um, I've inverted this fraction. Um, before it was this uh, fraction of documents containing a word. Now it's one over the fraction of the documents containing the word. So it gets bigger as the word gets rare. All right? Then we multiply the two. Term frequency multiplied by inverse document frequency. Um, this formula, along with cosine distance, is the most fundamental formula of uh, full text information processing. Um, basically, if you put those two things together, you have a search engine. Because how a search engine works is you compute the TF-IDF vectors for every document. Then you compute the TF-IDF vectors for the query that the user types in. And then you go through every document, and you take the cosine distance, and you order the results by from smallest to highest distance, and that's a search engine. Whoa, and it just went purple, didn't it? That's alarming. OK. Um, so this is, this is a standard formula. And you can build a great many things with this formula. Uh, a point that I want to um, drive home because this is not necessarily obvious. Hmm, interesting. OK, I'm sorry, guys. You might just have purple slides. It's very festive. Yeah. All right, purple slides. Um, yeah. uh, if TF. Let's, let's take a look at this. TF is a function of the term. So I say, what is the term frequency of cat? And the document, what is the term frequency of cat in this document? IDF is a function of, um, that's actually wrong. That should be T. It's a function of the term. So what is the inverse document frequency of cat? and a document set. So what is the inverse document frequency of cat in this set of documents? Uh, which means it's context sensitive. And if I add one document, then the IDF function changes for every word that is in that document. So now, here's the same document that we looked at earlier, the animal cruelty document. Using TFIDF scores, 
instead of word frequency. So now, what do you think this document is about? So first of all, what's, what's the difference? What's different between this list and the last list? Yeah, the common words are just gone. What else? What, what do we have instead? Much more focused. What do, we, what do you see, though? What do you think the document's about? What's that? It's ranked, but it was ranked in decreasing order before. Let's, let's take a look here. Ah, oh, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? There you go. Uh, before we had animal cruelty, crimes, and crime, which were the only things that weren't common words. Now what do we have that's not annual cruelty, crimes, and crime? We've got reporting, Michael, category, commit, criminal, societal, trends, conviction, and patterns. So what do you think this document is about? Yeah, well, we know it was about crimes before. What, what, are, what is trends and patterns and conviction? Well, maybe this isn't as obvious as I thought it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a document about, first of all, a particular crime. This guy, Michael. So his name is up there. Also, it's about legislation to track, to track uh, trends in animal cruelty. So the, the word trends and patterns and conviction didn't even show up in term frequency, but it's now in the top few words with CFIDF. Uh, and that's because in this document set, which is press releases, uh, those words appear you know, a few times in the document. So in the first two paragraphs, I see uh, patterns and trends, let's see, I see one trends, and I see two patterns. So they're not that common, but patterns and trends are probably quite rare in this document set as a whole, which means that the IDF term is weighting them quite high. The other way to think of IDF is what makes this document different from all the other documents? Make sense? All right. Uh, and then, again, look at this, right? This is the word cloud. Law is in there. Understand societal statistics, patterns, trends are going to be in here somewhere. But trends is probably quite small, right? It was probably amplified because it's very rare. So it, it, you know, all of this stuff is in there, but because it's now boosted, because there, there are words that are not common in the document set, um, we get a much better sense of what it's about. And so if we search, you know, uh, animal cruelty trends. This is going to come quite high, but if we just had work frequency, because, there's, because trends only appears maybe once in the document, it wouldn't uh, contribute very much to that uh, cosine score. This idea, inverse document frequency, in fact, this whole plan of how you do a search engine was put together by a bunch of people, uh, in particular a guy named Salton in the 60s and 70s. And um, this is from his paper where he describes the whole model. And what he's saying is, well, what you want for uh, a search engine is something that clusters 
documents together into groups and then puts a lot of space between them. Uh, and what he said was that what IDF does is tends to clump things together in the vector space. Uh, and he had some experiments in terms of calculating the density of the space and all this sort of thing. Uh, in fact, it's true. Um, this is uh, the same set of documents. Um, on the left is TF. On the right is TF-IDF. And uh, I mean, how would, you, how would you describe what it does? What's the difference between those two pictures? Yeah, spreads things out. In fact, what I think we're probably seeing is, see this, this sort of streak in the just TF? I bet you that corresponds. So this is a nonlinear projection, right? So it's not really clear what it's done to the space. It's like flattened it out in some weird way. But I bet you that this corresponds to the dimension of the word the, right? Or, or something else that's really common. Or Menendez, right? Because everyone is going to say, Senator Menendez does this or that. Um, but that's completely suppressed. And you get a lot more, more clarity. Like all of this you know, blue stuff is now in its own separate clusters. You know, some of it, you know, this was already an outlier. In fact, what this is, is this is uh, stuff that's in Spanish. Um, so it's a different set of words completely. But like this green, it's now much more tightly put together. Uh, the colors, by the way, are, are from me. That's from me um, tagging things and saying, ah, these are about this thing. So it's just to give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on. Um, it may not be obvious, but there's something extraordinary going on here, which is that I've just thrown a bunch of mathematics at you. I've said, you take these documents, you turn them into feature vectors with this TF-IDF formula. You've now got these points in this high dimensional space. You compute the angles between them. That gives you a distance metric, which gives you clusters. And a cluster means something. A cluster is a topic. It's, uh, that's, I find that actually very deep. Uh, what that is is that is that is a relationship between the mathematics and the meaning. And that's really what we're going for here. That's the, if, that's the summary of this entire course, right? How do I, how do I turn algorithmic approaches into meaning? Um, it's not obvious that this should be so, but it is. Uh, and, and this idea that clusters, well, so here it's been, it's been stated many times. It was first articulated in the early 70s. Documents in the same cluster behave similarly with respect to relevance to information needs. Another way of saying that is documents in the same cluster are about the same thing. Uh, you can't prove it because there isn't a mathematical definition of what about means. But it works, which is because this is how our modern systems are built. Um, and you can test this in various ways. Um, basically, the way you test this is you give all of the documents in a cluster to somebody and you say, what are they about? Or you give, um, you give a set of documents to humans and you ask the humans to sort them into piles and then you compare that to the clusters that the computer generates. And you find really good overlap, actually, really good matches. And as I've said, there's millions of variations on this, but um, you know, for example, we've only talked about using a, a feature vector as a single term. You could use bigrams, right? So uh, right now, women's issues would be women's and issues as two separate dimensions. But if I use bigrams, I, if I add a feature for every combination of two words, and women's issues is one term, and maybe I can start to extract some meaning. And, and, and I can now tell a little bit more about the structure. If I have trigrams, then soldiers shot civilians and civilians shot soldiers are now two different dimensions, which means I can tell them apart. And so you think, well, you know, if I add three grams, four grams, five grams, I must get much better results. But actually, you don't. 
it, you get marginally better results for certain types of things. Um, I don't find that at all obvious. Um, there are actually papers on why bigrams don't help, but they don't, not very much. Anyway, this model, counting words, encoding uh, a feature for every term, actually technically every token, right? It's not just words. Uh, 19, like we haven't actually done this, but um, Google ngrams, 1945, 1984, and that's the name of a book, 1945, 1960, um, 1990. Right, those are, those are tokens too. And you see this pattern, right? The usage of a year peaks in that year, or actually slightly after, and it looks like, because books take a while to publish, right? Um, so it's, it's tokens, which are collections of strings that you find interesting. And so you have to program your tokenizer to include the things that you want to look at. But anyway, this, this idea of you have a dimension for every term in the vocabulary, you do this TF-IDF thing, you normalize the vectors, you take the cosine distance, you look at the clusters. Uh, this is called the vector space document model. And this is the foundation of just about every text processing system. OK, so then um, let's do the break now. And uh, I'm going to show you a piece of software which does this uh, after the break. What I'm going to show you is uh, a tool built for journalists to analyze large sets of documents based on uh, exactly the principles we just talked about. Um, so this, each dot is a document, as usual. Um, I can click on a dot, and if the internet is nice to me, uh, load up all of the, there you go. There you go. So th th this is these guys' press releases, right? Here's his bill on rail solid waste. I, mean, I don't even know what that is. I guess that's moving garbage with trains. Um, here's something on another thing on rail safety. So hopefully those get clustered together. Um, I'm going to try to coordinate or to, to group them um, using multidimensional scaling. Oh, yeah, the other thing you can see here. Amtrak, rail, travel, transportation, transit, safety, train, operations, railroad, corridor. Um, this, these are the top few words as extracted by TFIDF from this set of 1,500 or so documents. So here we go. Um, one way to do a, an MDS algorithm is to start with all of the points in a random position and then pretend there's like a spring between each one, every possible pair, and sort of actually it's like you run a physical simulation. So here we go. Ooh, I know everybody loves this part. <laughs> I love this part. So there you go. Here we are. And you can see that it's, it's tried to pull similar ones together. So what's going on? Um, first thing I'm going to do is say, well, what are these outliers? Uh, this left-hand view is um, a clustering algorithm. It's a hierarchical clustering algorithm, which means that the computer has uh, tried to categorize things into, into clusters and subclusters. And you can see it sort of picked up this whole branch here. And what this is, if I look at one of these, well, I actually don't know what it is because it's in Spanish. Um, in fact, all of these are in Spanish. And you can see that the top word is, is que, which is, would be a Spanish stop word. But uh, it was expecting English, so it didn't remove the Spanish stop words. And what it's saying is, well, all of these words say que and para and los, which is the English equivalent of the and which and that. Um, so let's put them all over here. So um, I also have a tagging interface on this, and I'm going to say tag all these. So now I have, oh wait, I didn't want to call it tag. I wanted to call it Spanish. There we go. And then I can sort of grab the rest of them. So I can say, what's this? Oh, I do, I do do bigrams here. I know I just said they weren't useful for clustering, but what they are useful is for people to understand what you're looking at. So fire department. Um, 
well, this all seems to be fire station, fire safety, departments, firefighters, uh, now announced money for New Jersey fire departments. He's a senator from New Jersey, so this makes sense. Fire department receives, blah, 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 fire departments, fire departments. Okay, fine. Uh, no, so what it actually is is the, I'm displaying the HTML, but I've actually scraped the, the core text of the press release and I'm analyzing that. Do you just scrape it by the label? Yeah. Yeah, so actually that's a really good point, right? I'm going to show you a bunch of demonstrations. So you know on a cooking show where they're talking about some recipe and he's there like chopping something and then it suddenly says, here's one I made earlier, <laughs> right? That's what I'm doing here. Um, as those of you who have done data work know, 90% of the work is getting the data, you know, scraping it, cleaning it, organizing it. Like everything I'm about to show you, like remember all this stuff, right? These, this, this data file, I went from this to this CSV and like that was a pain too. And um, all of this stuff, let me put it this way. If this was the only course you took, you'd be a terrible data journalist because you'd have no experience with the real problems like, how do I scrape the PDFs from the site? And then how do I get the tables from the PDF? And oh, actually they're images, so I need to OCR it first. And the CSV that I just downloaded is in, it's, it's actually not a valid CSV file. Anyway, that's, that's real life. Um, but in our perfect little, uh, prepared an advanced world. I've now got fire departments. And I can, I can do this, uh, go through this either by um, manually sort of grabbing clusters, but I actually don't have that great of separation from this stuff. So I'm actually going to look at the hierarchical uh, tagging here. So this is Iraq Veterans War Children's Coverage. What's actually going on here is these are, I, I've been through this before, so I know this really well. This is actually about Children's Health Insurance, and this is about Veterans Health. So they're both health related, um, but one is kids and one is uh, Iraq War Veterans. Uh, here you go. Oh, and uh, here is both in one speech. Anyway. Um, and you can see that in a bunch of other things. Uh, like, what was a good example here? This was a nice one. All of this stuff is about airports. Oh, and you can, if I zoom out a little bit, you can see there's actually two groups corresponding to the left and right sides of this. Uh, this is about airport uh, improvements, some money to improve the airports. This is about airport delays. Uh, and that's kind of how it goes. You can go through this system and um, tag, uh, you know, one cluster at a time. Uh, and people have done stories with this. This is actually a prototype. I'm using it because it has this, this MDS display at the multidimensional scaling display on the right-hand side. So you can get a, a sense for what you're actually doing in the vector space. What we found, though, is that users didn't really use this. They mostly went through one at a time, these, this clustering system on the left. And we know that because it actually writes logs of all the user actions, and we analyzed those, and we also just interviewed them. Um, and so the, the production version, this is an early version, uh, first of all, the production version is web-based. So it runs on a, on a server. Um, wow, it's really big at this resolution. This might look horrible because the screen is smaller than normal. The production version looks like this. Looks like nothing yet. All right. Um, it's still got the hierarchical clustering, but now that instead of just a dot, it actually, the width controls how, uh, it determines how many documents are in there. This is a set of about 3,000 documents from USAID, which is the United States Government Agency for international development. This is the agency that supports development projects uh, around the world. And uh, this is all of their documents, basically, that talk about HIV. 
and they asked me to do an analysis of them. And so you can see all of these different clusters that I made, like children. Uh, these are all the nodes that talk about children or um, uh, conflict. Where did conflict go? This is, you know, issues relative to HIV and conflict. Only one document, I guess. Uh, and then it also found, like, these are all the documents that are in French. Um, anyway, so it just goes, and there's various plans. This was a plan that the President Bush had to do this. And then I have, like, I don't even know how to categorize this. Um, uh, so it sort of goes on and on, and then you have a document viewer on the right here. And this is actually Document Cloud, which I hope some of you have heard of. Uh, which is a, a free tool for journalists to do document analyses. And it integrates, so you, Im you import it into Document Cloud and then um, you can view it in Overview. And then also, you can turn on the sidebar and you can actually like, write notes in here uh, within Document Cloud. And this is all based on exactly what we did, right? What, what, you're, looking for, what you're looking at on, this, on the left side here in this tree view is um, I take the documents, I uh, turn them into TF-IDF vectors, uh, and then I use cos cosine distance as, as a distance metric and apply a hierarchical clustering algorithm, and this is what comes out. And then I have this tagging interface, because just because something is a cluster doesn't mean that it doesn't tell the human what it is. What, what I've done is I labeled each cluster by the um, the top words in it. So here you go, foods, uh, PHA is persons with HIV AIDS, uh, eat nutritional milk, energy, water. So that's like something about nutrition, right? And in fact, yes, it is something about uh, nutrition. Here's a chart for how to eat if you have AIDS. Um, But that's not, you know, there's thousands and thousands of words that are extracted, right? That's not the same as going through this and say, oh, um, nutrition, where is it? Nutrition. Nutrition is a category. And uh, there are all of the uh, places where you have documents about nutrition. This other document node is just all of the little small ones that are grouped together. Whoa, look at all of those. Anyway. Um, the point of having the tagging and the clustering is that the clusters that the computer builds are not necessarily the same as the categories that are interesting for the story. And also, there might be a lot of overlap, right? So if I take this, this document here, this is about uh, nutrition. There you go, training manual for nurses and widows. It's about nutrition and children and training. So I can apply multiple tags to each document. So the, the, the way the system is built is the computer does the sort of first pass of analysis, and then the human has to go through and figure out what are the interesting categories for the story. And uh, then at some point, I guess, you write the story. So that's uh, what I've been working on. And it's all based on exactly what I've shown you. Um, Moving on. First of all, questions, comments on that? Yeah. So all the time there was done manually? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in both of these systems. Yeah, I created all of these tags. But mostly what you find is that a, you know, a document will have one big tag on it, right? So this is, um, actually, I don't even know what tag. E economic impact, there you go. But then some of the documents might have multiple tags as well. Because the computer doesn't necessarily know how you want to organize the documents. It's just applying this distance metric. So it's going to come up with some weird stuff. And it might not organize it the way that's interesting for the story that you're working on. Do you actually read the entire document? No, the point is to not read the entire document right? until you've discovered which documents are relevant. So if I've, you know, it's, it's the, the use case for this is very often you get a bunch of stuff and you don't really know what you have. So you file a Freedom of Information request, you get 1,000 pages, and you're like, OK, what's in this 1,000 pages? And presumably, you would, you know, in practice, what people do is you do this, and then you're like, well, 
The only thing I'm really interested is uh, community involvement in HIV. So I'm going to take my community tag, and then I'll take the documents, and then these ones I'm going to read much more carefully. These are long, 400 pages. Wow. That's a lot of text. This raises another issue, actually. Uh, a document is not well defined. Just because something is in one PDF doesn't mean you should treat it as one object in terms of the document vector representation. Um, you might want to take this document, which is 400 pages, and break it into uh, chapters, for example. Or uh, what some people have actually done is they've broken it into pages. Often you don't know what the right structure for a document is, so you just turn every page into uh, a, an object and apply TFIDF to the, uh, ob to the text on that page. And so you can think of it as, this is sort of how to think of it, right? I hand you a stack of, of paper, whoomph, and the paper is stapled into documents, and these 400 pages are stapled in one document. And you have a bunch of different ways you can organize it. I say, sort this information into piles. So you could, look at, you could read the title of each document and be like, oh, that's community development, that's nutrition, that's economic impact. Or you could be like, let's rip out the staples and sort the individual pages. Or you could look more closely at each document and try to break it into chapters and sort the chapters. Or you could break it into paragraphs, like there's a... Um, it, it does matter because you'll get different answers. Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, we're still experimenting with for different types of reporting problems, what the right unit of analysis is. It's not completely obvious. For some things, it's really clear. Like if you're you know, trying to categorize um, things that are relatively short, like tweets or something, you don't break a tweet into two pieces. But if, when you get longer and longer documents, you have to think about this. Uh, other thoughts, questions? Okay. Topic models. Um, we've looked at using TF-IDF to tell us the, document, the topics in a single document. That is not the same as the topics in a set of documents. TFIDF gives us a vector for each document, and we can look at the top weighted words. And so we can do this sort of thing, right? The, um, you know, these, this list of words sort of gives us an idea of the topics in this document. If I give you 20 documents, and I say, what are the topics in these documents, that's, that's kind of a different problem. That's what we're trying to do here. It's, the problem is called topic modeling. So, the, you know, where actually this started, and a lot of the research literature uh, begins this way, is uh, academic literature, right? I've, I've got 100,000 papers stored online in journals, and I want to I wanna know, you might be interested in how the topics changed over time. Are people doing more research in genetics now than they were in the 1990s? Uh, is it less fashionable to do content analyses of media? Uh, if you know the particular topic you're interested in, maybe you can do keyword searches and do like quantitative, you know, just word counting over time. But maybe the question is more general. What are the topics? That's topic modeling. It's when you don't know the topics and you're asking what they are. Uh, so there's a really simple thing that you can do if you have TFIDF vectors. And that's just to take the 10 documents that you want to know the topics of, or the however many documents, 23, I guess, and just add the TFIDF vectors together. Just, just add them. And then take the top terms again. Um, it's really fast. It's really easy to code. Um, and you know it works reasonably well. So for example, in this document, Angola, it, it seems that the country name tends to be the top rated term, probably because it's the only document with that country name. Um, but overall, 
you know, firms appears in every firms, mining, macroeconomic, labor, crops, cost, engineers, loss, impacts. We're talking about something about the economy of mining. You know, it's, I don't know, you get some idea. You'd have to go and read them to get a better idea, but it, it, it kind of works. Um, it's, it's not going to work very well when uh, topics aren't represented well by individual words, right? So I could have, it's, it, you have a couple problems. You have multiple meanings of the same word and that word is going to rank very highly even though it's com two completely different topics. Or you have one idea that's expressed in different ways. You know, as we saw, there's lots of different ways to talk about feminism, right? Uh, and so that means that um, although feminism, you know, if I have three different documents and one says feminism, another says women's issues, and another says, I don't know, uh, sexism or something, um, when I add them all together, they're going to they're gonna end up in different words, whereas all three of them might also talk about manufacturing. And because it uses the same word in each document, when I add everything together, that's going to get a much higher score. So, you know, this isn't, this has problems. This has problems because what we really want is a subject, but we don't have subjects. We have words. And words are not the same as subjects. But nonetheless, you're going to do this on your assignment, on the first assignment, um, as, a, as a fast way to understand what a, what a set of documents are about. Uh, but you can do a lot better. Um, there, there's a whole research area called topic modeling. And what topic modeling is, is trying to pull out the topics in a vector. So we're going we're gonna to take a, a topics of a document. We're going to take a document again, and once more, we're going to turn it into feature vectors. But this time, instead of the features being words, they're going to be topics. So it's, uh, it's also, a di you can think of it as a dimension reduction step, right? We, we turn a document. Uh, into uh, a vector of topic weights, and then we can use, in fact, we can still use cosine distance. Uh, we can normalize it, we can do clustering, we can do all of the things that we might want to do uh, with a feature vector. Um, there are a lot of algorithms, they have names. Um, most of them, what they do is they start with the bag of words model. So again, the first thing we do is we just count how many times each word appears. Um, because that's, as we've seen, that's a pretty good representation of the semantics of a document. But we start with bag of words, and then we, we come up with um, a low dimensional approximation. We say, I mean, how many of you are familiar with the idea of, of approximation in, in mathematics or, or statistics? The idea that you, OK. So the idea is, oh, lossy compression. Everybody knows what lossy compression is, like JPEG, with the idea, or, or MP3. The idea is you throw out most of the information, but you keep the most important parts. That's the idea in how these topic modeling algorithms work, right? It's we're going to turn these documents, or these, these full lists of words, into a small number of factors. And then we can reconstruct approximately what words were in the document from the small number of factors. Um, so this is how it goes. This is the, a, uh, the most common method. It's called uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, or LDA. Um, Dirichlet, because that's just the name of the type of probability distribution it uses. For our purposes, it's a meaningless word. It's, just, it's actually someone's name. Um, Latent because the idea is that there were topics that the author of the, the document had in mind when they wrote it, so they're hidden. And allocation because what we're doing is we are assigning words to topics and topics to documents. And so 
of course, this isn't how actually how people write a document, but this is what you imagine. You say, I'm going to sit down uh, and I'm going to write 500 documents. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to start with each document and I'm going to say, what are the topics in this document? I think this document is about 50% fishing, 30% genetics, and 20% legislation. So this is going to be a document about the effect of government legislation on the genetics of ocean fish stocks. All right, so that is a distribution of topics for a document. Um, how many of you are familiar with conditional probability notation? This, this uh, P of Z given D? Yeah? OK. So it means, what that means is that if I know which document I'm, I'm looking at, that D, um, I have a distribution over topics, which is that 50, 20, 30 thing. Um, and uh, for some reason in, the, in this literature, the, the topic distribution is always Z. I don't really know why. And then I'm going to write this document by saying, OK, it's going to be a 1,000 words long. And each word, I'm going to say, which topic between fishing, legislation, and genetics is this word going to be about? And I pick the topics according to those distributions. So half of the words are going to be about fishing. And then once I know which topic that word is about, I'm going to say, well, a topic is a distribution of words. That's um, P of uh, words given topics, or P of W given Z. Um, and so if it's about fishing, then you know, the top, or if it's about fish, the top word is probably fish. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, it, it could be, I could have words like sea, or spawn, or scales, or, you know, any of the other words that go together with fish. Salt, tasty, I don't know. Um, so it's this multi-step process. So here, here's the idea. We start with, um, here's two different documents. Uh, each, and what we've done is we've colored the words that are about different to doc topics. So you can see the green words in that first document are uh, river-related words, Mississippi, river. And then there's like music-related words, concert, pianist, jazz, piano, music, lessons, listening, music. And here's a different document. It has, different, it has a different set of topics. And some of the words are about actors, audiences, play, and some of the words are about reading. And the, the two documents have a different distribution of topics. One's about rivers and music. The other's about actors and reading, apparently, and some other things, too. And then what a topic is, is it's a di distribution of words. So here's, here are those, those things that we saw, right? The, OK, so topic 137. The most likely word for topic 137 is river. Also, lands, rivers, valley, built, water, floods, Nile flows, rich, dam, flow, banks, right? So it's a river-ish topic. Uh, whereas this other one, literature, poem, poetry, poet, plays, little, 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 Shakespeare, it looks like it's about literature and poetry. Um, sometimes you say, well, this is the river topic, this is the literature topic, this is the music topic, but this isn't really the literature topic. This is the, looks like performed poetic drama topic is maybe one way to think about it. Uh, and in fact, there's a real difference, right? So this has a very sharp distribution. River is most of the probability, maybe 90%, and then everything falls off very fast. Whereas this has uh, a much longer tail distribution. Um, and especially if, you're, if your topic is spread over many words with a long tail, it's, it might be hard to describe. Uh, but this is the statistical model of a topic is a distribution over words. And then a document is a distribution over topics. Is this making sense? I know it's a bit abstract. Um, here's the, the, I gave you in your readings an article on uh, how this works. Um, it, it discusses it in more detail. 
Um, the, the point of the algorithm is to take the words in each document and turn them into a set of topics for each document and a set of words for each topic. And so this is just another picture of the same thing. These are the different topics in this document. And then um, for each word, we pick a topic, we choose one, and then for that word, we pick a word in that topic. And here's another example, the same thing, right? This, these words in quotes, the computer didn't make that. That's just a human trying to summarize what that topic is. Now, remember, all that the computer is doing is looking at patterns of words that appear together. So actually, this is an overly nice example. It's very easy to say, oh, that's the genetics topic. But you know, uh, I had someone, a student, apply this algorithm to movie reviews. And you kind of want, like, oh, I want the action movie topic, the drama topic, the, the good movie topic, the bad movie topic. No, that's not what they got. They got the Transformers topic, <laughs> right? Because you tell the computer how many topics, and you say, oh, use 50 different topics. And, or, and then you got topics which you simply couldn't interpret. It had some names of actors, but the actors never appeared in movies together. And you know, it's, um, it's very easy to, to, to model the noise in, in the document set. And in fact, um, you're going to apply this algorithm. You're not going to code it, because it's a fairly complicated algorithm. But you'll apply this algorithm, and you'll see that uh, the lists of words don't always make sense. Um, it is all it's doing is modeling words that are trying to model words that appear together, and it might find things that don't actually make any sense. But anyway, um, yeah, the idea is here on the left of the picture is the distribution of topics for a single document. Um, so this document is mostly about this, but also about this and this. And then in the right uh, are what a topic means. And you can do some really cool stuff with this. So this tells you the topics in a particular set of documents. If you apply this at different time periods, um, oh yeah, OK, let's backing up until the pretty picture at the end of the class. So this is what you're doing. It's, it's, you're reducing the dimension of the feature space. And you kind of hope that maybe you only have 10 or 20 or 50 different documents rather than 10,000 different words. Uh, and yet, you've still captured the important concepts. The, uh, you feed it a bunch of words for each document. What you get out is a lower dimensional set of features. Normally, you tell it. You say, try to fit 10 different topics to these documents, or fit 50 different topics. And the dimensions aren't words. They're you know, you, you hope they're concepts, but really what they are is distributions over words. And then once you have this smaller feature space, then you can do all of the clustering stuff. Um, so then you can do stuff like this. This is, uh, it was done from news articles, like, um, oh no, because it goes back to 1880. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know what the original data set is. Um, but each topic is a color. And then up here, you can see what are, the t what are the top words for that topic. And so you can look at this picture and kind of tell stories. Like, uh, you know, in the 20s through the 40s, German, Germanic, and Polish was a big thing. And it was appeared in a lot of stories. Uh, American, South, and Black has kind of been constant. Uh, Latin American has really increased since the 1960s. I have no idea what this is, right? I'm just making up these stories. But you can get these sort of time-based topic analyses. And we're going to do one uh, in the assignment, although not uh, with this technique yet. That's the next assignment. OK, that is the last slide. We're now going to talk about the assignment. but. Um, any sort of, can you imagine when you would want to use this? Can anyone give an example of when you'd want to produce an analysis like this?
Yeah, that's interesting. Or look at how, what? The SKT, because it directly Yeah. Or, or yes? Mm -hmm. There are uh, letters between U.S. Dipl diplomat and U.S. president, I guess. Ah. You can do similar analysis to what Americans are focusing on in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One day. One day. <laughs> um, there's actually nothing stopping anyone from doing that. In fact, I'm, I'm sure that somebody's done it somewhere. Um, or even, you know, we saw earlier uh, the work on graphing the use of the term harmonious society, right? That's one term, and you had to know that you should focus on that term. Another way to think of this is, tell me, I want to feed all of the words, and tell me which of the words are most important. Uh, it's, it's a sort of mass text analysis technique. But... You know, you, you hope that it uh, maps to concepts and ideas and the way that we already understand what it is to read an editorial in the People's Daily and the, we think about it in terms of the party and they're worried about economics and they're worried about social unrest and they're worried about uh, you know, immigration and all of whatever all that they're worried about. Um, but that's not actually what the computer does. The computer is just displaying statistical statistical patterns in the information. And if you use a different algorithm for topping modeling, you're going to get different patterns, uh, which comes back to this point about robustness that we talked about in the, the first lecture, which is if you want to draw conclusions like this, you should probably try different techniques and see if they give you different answers. Because if two different techniques give you two different answers, then either the pattern isn't really there in some sense, or you have to explain why one technique gives you a good answer and the other one gives you a bad answer. And these techniques are very complicated. There's often no simple way to say why one technique gives one answer and another technique gives a different answer. What else do you want to use this on? Political speeches, yeah. And we're going to do that. The assignment is with State of the Union addresses, American political street speeches. How about, uh, you know, Weibo messages over time? Are people talking about different things now than they were last year? You could do that. Lyrics. lyrics. Yeah. Well, what you're going to see for lyrics is the, the biggest one is going to be like love songs, <laughs> you know, like relationships. Relationships, and then a uh, you know, little one be like money, I, I don't know. Yeah. Lots of possibilities. All right, the assignment. The assignment. Um, here is your first assignment. It is on the blog. Your assignment is to take the corpus of State of the Union speeches. This is a speech that has been given by the American president every year since George Washington. Uh, and can apply the TF-IDF algorithm to it, and then tell me what you've learned from doing it. So the first few steps in this is just nah, 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 nah. Um, up until step six is just the mechanics of going through it. You start with um, where is it? There you go. You start with this. This is a CSV file. It's got two columns. One is the year. The second is the text. You load this into Python. This is almost 2 million words. It's kind of boring, actually, mostly. These speeches are like an hour long, and there's over 200 of them. Um, 
So there you go. You can see somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. It just goes on and on and on. This is why you want topic analysis. It's far too much to read. Um, oh my god. Who was this guy and what was he saying? <laughs> there we go. That was 1904. It's probably Roosevelt. Uh, and then 1905, Roosevelt said this. Um, and then you're going to pick one year. I and mean, actually, we're going to assign the years. I think what we're going to do is uh, 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. You're going to display the top 20 words, and you're going to tell me what that speech was about. And then you're going to look at each decade from 1900 to present, and you're going, so you'll get 10 speeches in each decade, and you're going to average together the TFIDF vectors, or add them together, actually, and then print out the average, or the, the, the sum, so that is equivalent to... Um, See here, 14 documents in node, indicator, numerator, denominator, indicators. Wow, this is really about indicators and numerators and denominators, but it's a paper about evaluation, so that makes sense. So that's what Overview is doing with this line where it tells you what the 14 documents together are about. You're going to do that for each decade. So you're going to get it for 10 different, or uh, I guess 12 different decades, and uh, from 1900. And then I want you to write in words, uh, about 500 words, and you're going to write a little story about how the topics have changed and maybe why. You know, do you see patterns? Are, are presidents talking more about one thing now than they were 100 years ago? Uh, did they talk about the war? Did they talk about the Depression? Uh, to try to fit this to historical context. One of the big difficulties with text analysis is that we have a lot of algorithms. We're not really sure what they mean. It seems like you can tell what a document is about by looking at TFIDF scores. But you know there are a lot of different ways to interpret a document. If you're a literature scholar, you call these readings. I'm going to take this novel and I'm going to uh, do a uh, feminist reading of it, which means I'm going to understand what it uh, says from the viewpoint of feminism. Or I'm going to do a uh, reading in the context of the war that was happening at the time that nobody was talking about. Or I'm, you know, th there's this whole, um, there's an entire professional field about interpreting text. And algorithmic interpretations are really just one other way to do it. Now, they have some advantages. Oh, we're not going to read two million words for an assignment. And as journalists, this is very helpful to be, to be able to understand what a document is about without reading it, which seems like cheating, but maybe it works. We're going to find out. Um, so I've got four people, and I'm going to assign them 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. So remember, you're going to compute the TF-IDF vectors on the whole document set because, of course, the IDF depends on every document. So you're going to read all, I think there's like 220 of them or something, 221. Um, you're going to compute the vectors on the entire document set, but then you're just going to pick this one year and print out the top uh, weighted words. and. Tell me what the document is about. Now, uh, you're absolutely allowed to read the speech. <laughs> okay, So you don't have to just use the words. Because if you're a journalist, in reality, you can read it right? if it's there. So you're going to compute the TFIDF vectors for 1960, and then you know, read as much of it as you feel you need to, or scan through, or keyword search. You can do anything you want. The point is, you're going to have the TFIDF vectors. Yeah? Sorry, is it one year or a decade? You do both. There's, you're gonna do, there's two types of analysis. You do this one year, and then you're also going to do the decades. Yeah. But um, 
But, but the comparison we're only going to do with individual years, because otherwise the people doing decades would have to read a lot of text. Um, so you're going to do this analysis based on one year. And then I need five other people. Uh, no, one, two, three, four, six other people to volunteer to read the speech from that year, which is actually less work than writing the code, if you think about it. Um, and what we're going to do is at the start of the next class, the two people who worked on 1980, um, well, first of all, you're both going to give me a, a short written description, right? So it doesn't have to be long. So, not, you know, 100 words, 200 words, uh, a short, a brief description of what you think the subject of the speech is. And we're going to compare them. We're going to put them up on the screen, and we're going to say, with the computer, these are the words that I had. This is what I think the speech is about. Without the computer, this is what I think the speech is about. And in fact, um, if enough of you are game, what I want to do is assign two people to manually read each speech. Uh, so two people will read 1980, and one person will do the computer analysis. Why do you think I want to have multiple people on each year? Yeah, I'm trying to separate two different sources of variation. I'm trying to separate natural differences in people. So if I give two people the same speech and ask them to write the same story, uh, they're going to write two different stories. Right? So one is variation, just natural uh, human variation. And the other is variation between using the computer and not using the computer. So if I don't have at least two people for each speech, then I don't have any idea how much variation is due to a different technique, and how much variation is due to a different person. Um, and then we're going to write all this up. Uh, I've never seen anyone try this. Um, I'm sure people have experimented with this. I've never seen anyone write it up. So uh, if you will work with me to do this and take it seriously, uh, we're actually going to produce a new piece of knowledge in the field of text analysis. So. Uh, with that incentive, with, with only your, your, your intellectual curiosity and your, your love of scholarship to, to drive you, I need 12 volunteers to read a speech and write, uh, let's say, no more than 200 word summary. <laughs> 